you know, finance is a fascinating uh, industry, especially on the funds management side where you get to learn about businesses in all sorts of different industries, different parts of the world. You know, there's a fair bit of human nature and psychology that comes into investing there. There's an art component to it as well as just a science component. So I think if you are in the right place and have the right uh, mandate client base, it, it can be one of the most interesting jobs you know out there in the world. And you, your good days can be good, your bad days can be um, wobbly, but you, you don't have anyone's life in your hands. You have you know a, a lot of responsibility. And yeah, I, I just find it I find it interesting, and it, and it helps uh, through all aspects of life. Understanding what makes a good investment works in the share market. It works when you're buying a home. It works when you're selling a used car. Welcome back, everyone, to the few in lockdown. When will it end? When will it end? Uh, I guess the upside of everyone being in lockdown is pretty easy to get hold of uh, podcast guests and I get to stay home and work uh, out of the few podcast uh, sneaky studio up in the bush behind my house. Today's guest, super interesting. I think uh, he works in a mysterious world that we often see uh, on TV. Uh, it sounds pretty cool, but we generally don't have a clue uh, what goes on there. Uh, before we do that, though, my uh, co-host and all-round legend and someone who's not in lockdown right now, Sean Shawnee Sewell. G'day, Sean. How are you, mate? Really good, Boo. And uh, yeah, feeling for everyone in uh, the areas of uh, Australia and elsewhere that are locked down, but um, up here in sunny Queensland, thankfully, uh, we've dodged a bullet a little bit a couple of times. So uh, we're, not, we're not in lockdown at the moment. It's just masks. So I uh, can't really complain about that. So it's doing pretty well. But I'm excited for today's guest, having come from a bit of a financial background myself. Um, yeah, looking forward to getting stuck in. I certainly am as well. I don't think I've ever been successful in financial markets. It just reinforces that lesson that you shouldn't really invest and play and do things where you've got no idea what's going on. So let's talk to someone that does know what's going on. Uh, our guest is he started his own hedge fund, which is uh, pretty cool, pretty epic. Um, if you watch uh, the telly or uh, billionaires, you, you see that uh, hedge funds pretty exciting volatile part of the world uh but um today's guest is is just not that personality i've known him since school actually and uh a real cool cat so with no further ado uh, let's welcome in ben mcgarry uh, uh, one of the first ben. questions i'd love to ask is uh if you were say in an elevator and someone asked you so what is a hedge fund how would you answer that question yeah well i had to describe it to my kids and um you know <laughs> the, trying to get it to that elevator pitch was you know people trust me with their money to um to look after it and my job is to give them back more than they gave me when um you know when they want it back um uh, and that that's the simplest way to do it and then and then, then you and the way we try to do it is find great companies with tar wins uh that generate a lot of cash and then balance out a portfolio with other companies that are facing challenges and if you can take that medium to longer term view it's it's worked out well so far and fingers crossed it it, it should continue to work out so that's what I do in a nutshell. I presume you explain that with Lego blocks, mate. Obviously, like this, uh, this is this brick here of six. That's six million, and this eight brick is eight. And we put all these bricks together to create more bricks. Yeah, I mean, look. Sometimes the kids come through with insights that you know are so obvious that you should have thought of them yourself. Uh, for example, uh, Dad, why didn't you just buy? Bitcoin, it was so obvious. Just just buy a little bit of everything new, and uh, one or, one or two of them are going to sail over the boundary, and and off you go. And when it when you put it that way, um, it does sound easy, but uh, it's it's not quite quite that easy. So obviously, you started this yourself, mate. So what was the trigger? What made you decide to back yourself and start your own business? On the few we. We often talk to people that have started something that's never existed before they had that concept. So what was it? Why, why, why did you embrace this crazy idea, go high risk and start your own biz? Yeah, I mean, in hindsight, it probably was the, the riskiest thing I've, I've done and um, maybe a little bit out of character, but I, there's, there's no one single um, reason to do it. It was a combination of things, you know, I, my... my Dad was in small business, uh, was his own boss for many years. Um, you know, I, I was also, um, uh, you know, perhaps a, a little bit of a, 
um, an independent thinker and perhaps not as good at taking instruction as, as some people, my, my wife would, would uh, agree to that. Uh, so, you know, potentially self-employment was the right place for me long term a- anyway. And I, I had an idea and, and some, you know, reasonable success early in my career identifying some businesses with challenges and also some really great businesses that compounded away. So I was able to put a little bit of capital away and, and, and have that nest egg to, um, to give something a go. And I went around to uh, a bunch of more established investment uh, funds and, and businesses and said, look, I've got this idea for this fund that's going to own great companies and short uh, companies facing challenges. And I think this will work out well and offer clients something that they can't do for themselves. Um, and, you know, what do you think? And a lot of them um, thought it was a reasonable idea, but the the product or the timing didn't suit their individual businesses. So um, I had some, you know, I was lucky enough to get some advice from some of these guys that were, were very successful in their own businesses. Um, the one that springs to mind is David Paradise, who's, who said to me very early on, you know, if, if you really think this thing's going to work, you should back yourself and, and do it yourself. You don't need a big brother. And, um, you know, I, I suppose that made the going pretty tough to start with. Um, but at times that's been a blessing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have, you know, a business that's been going for almost 10 years, um, no external shareholders. Um, and, yeah, so far so good. What is it about the, was the financial market that, uh, that interests you, that, that keeps you after 10 years of doing it? And I believe you've got a background in accounting and things like that as well. So what is it about numbers, finance, you know, the financial markets? What's, what's, it, what's the driver behind that for you? Yeah, I mean, for someone who I suppose as a kid, who might remember, I, I loved reading, a um, bit of a bookworm, had a, had a uh, not necessarily um, great at any one particular topic, but had a broad interest in a number of topics. And, um, you know, finance is a fascinating uh, industry, especially on the funds management side where you get to learn about businesses in all sorts of different industries, different parts of the world. You know, there's a fair bit of human nature and psychology that comes into investing. There, there's an art component to it as well as just a science component. So I think if you are in the right place and have the right uh, mandate and client base, it, it can be one of the most interesting jobs, you know, out there in the world. And you're not, um, you know, your good days can be good, your bad days can be um, wobbly, but you, you don't have anyone's life in your hands. You have, you know, a, a lot of responsibility. Um, but uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, the, it's 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 money. Um, and yeah, I, I just find it I find it interesting, and it, and it helps uh, through all aspects of life. Understanding what makes a good investment works in the share market. It works when you're buying a home. It works when you're selling a used car. You know, it's, it's, it's a very good practical, um, not quite as good as being a chippy, but, but pretty good. How do you, you, you mentioned there the art and science. And, and for me, that's a really fascinating area to work in, uh, in any organisation, because people have ideas, they've got uh, big dreams and strategies they want to get done, but really you're projecting into the future. So it's an unknown. It's, it, it is, it is kind of out there. Uh, so how do you find a transitioning or finding the balance between science and art when you're making decisions? Yeah, well, I think um, actually the longer I've been doing this, the more important I think that art component is to it uh, because you can, uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, 25, 26 year olds that are, are far better on a spreadsheet than I am and can come up with a more accurate forecast, um, a more detailed model. Um, but but I, over time that sort of, reliance on accuracy can um, can be a you know a hindrance in in financial markets because there's there's animal spirits in you know human nature there's there's fear and greed um, and and being um, you know I suppose mature enough or or um, being able to recognize that there's times when you've got to get out of the way you might be right but if you're if you're right at the wrong time you're still wrong um, you know, I think that's something that comes with experience, and um, you know, that's something that you know I've had to focus on a little, a little more in, in recent years because we've got into you know more and more interesting markets uh, as as my career's gone on. So, just to add to that, Ben, I mean, assuming when you say it's more of an art, are you referring to that kind of that kind of gut feeling or instinct to go with something? 
when oh. yeah, when you're not as focused on the detail or the spreadsheet or the number as much, but you've got a feel for what's happening? Well, I'm thinking about, you know, more in the last 12 months in a post-COVID um, environment where people were stuck at home, you know, as, as Boo said, there's, you know, people are bored, they're, um, they're looking for thing, activities online. And we had a, a, a period of time last year where, you know, sport was shut down in, in most of the world. You know, people didn't have that activity to go to on the weekend. Um, that they didn't have that, um, you know, gambling um, outlet, and the stock market became a um, a conduit for for people's entertainment. And um, you know, we've had the rise of meme stocks and short squeezes and crypto and um, things that you know at the beginning of my career, you know, nobody had heard of. So uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting time where, as a fundamental investor, we had to sort of you know, put ourselves in the shoes of a, uh, you know, uh, a kid in their in their mom's basement trading, um, you know, story stocks and with options um, that, that was creating huge volatility in equity markets and, and some really experienced uh, hedge fund investors around the world got caught out by that environment. So, so you had to put numbers aside for a period, um, you know, to to survive and protect capital. So. Does so that do you feel that that has gone back to some semblance of normality, for want of a better term? I think we're slowly getting back there. We're still in a a weird situation where you know markets and asset prices are, are heavily supported by um, cheap money from central banks. Governments are also throwing money at people um, and businesses. We're in, we're in an unusual situation um, historically, but yeah, it's it's a more normal year. Um, what is going on in the world? Everyone I speak to who's in financial markets, in banking, wherever, no one's seen this before. And I'm talking about people who are in their 70s and 80s who have made a career out of investing and they just raise their eyebrows and shrug their shoulders and they're like, no idea. Is there is there some rhythm or destination here or are we just in free fall? Let's just see what happens. That's a great question. Um, you know, I get that from my clients all the time and you know if you leave the party too early um you know you could be you could be out of business because it could the market could be 30 or 40 percent higher before things correct um all i can say is that it's a you know it's a new paradigm of of experimentation where you know governments have said we're not going to let businesses fail we're not going to let companies um fire people we're not going to um um you know, we'll do whatever it takes. People don't have to pay their home loans back. People don't have to pay their rent. Um, you know, these are throat ripping up contract law um, principles that have been in place in our society for, for hundreds of years. So, um, look, I, I don't know when the party's going to end, but but typically um, there's a gravitational pull for asset prices and it's the return you can get on those assets over time. So, yeah, I, I think party on for now but maybe a little closer to the exits um just have one eye on the door be my advice can you can you break it down for you know sean and myself who who tend to have the comprehension of a seven-year-old uh when it comes to the few break break down hedge funds in five minutes in terms of like what is what's we, we hear about you know short selling in the market and the big short and this kind of this new concept where traditionally um, most people know that you buy a stock, it grows, and in 10 years' time, you've made a bit of money on the way through with your dividends and the assets appreciated and you cash out. Then short selling came around. So tell, tell us a bit about hedge funds, why sometimes they get a bad rep uh, and, and why they are valuable. Yeah, look, um, there's all sorts of different hedge funds. There's equity hedge funds, which are invest in listed shares. There's um, Hedge funds that invest just in options or in a particular market. Uh, there's debt versions of hedge funds. Um, what we run is a, an equity long short fund where we we buy shares just like your mum and dad would buy Telstra or, or Macquarie Bank. Um, we try to buy you know the best uh, companies we can find in our in our long book. And then what we're trying to offer clients is um, a different return profile. So something that might zig when other parts of their portfolio zags. And, and how we do that is by 
trying to balance that portfolio out with companies that are facing challenges. Um, and we've got a, a bunch of things we look for that, you know, help us sort of zero in on parts of the market that look interesting. It might be might be where you see the whole management team, you know, dump their shares um, unexpectedly or, um, you know, we, we, we dig into the weeds of accounting and look for aggressive uh, accounting. Uh, I think you're being, a bit, you're being a little bit humble here, mate. I mean, this really was your niche, wasn't it? This, this was the thing that, that you discovered when you were working in the system, right? You were, you were tracking ABC childcare and, and you actually observed some activity there that no one else was seeing, right? And, and this started to create your reputation. So tell us a bit about that story because without, without that insight, without doing the hard yards and being good at what you do, you would have never been able to start your own hedge fund, right? Well, that's, yeah, that's true. You've got to find something that, that the big institutions find a bit harder to do. And, um, you know, every once in a while you'll come across a special situation like ABC Learning where the market had fallen in love with a story and a founder that's got a lot of charisma and, um, and share prices get carried away. And when you do, a, you know, some digging beneath the surface and, you, you, you know, you start finding things that don't add up. And we, we found um, a bunch of things um, you know, with that company that, that gave us pause. And I was an analyst back at UVS um, doing sell-side research for, for clients, um, you know, like we are now. And, and um, ABC Learning was just a, a fascinating one where, um, you know, that their, their debt was always higher than it should have been every time they reported. Uh, you know, they, they told a, a story about, a, you know, a capital light business model where, where returns were always going to go up. But when you actually looked at their financial statements and modelled it out, the returns were always going down. Um, and that, yeah, we turned out, it turned out that my scepticism around the stock was right. Um, I got hired from UBS into a, a big fund manager called Osbill Dexia on the balance of that, uh, on the back of that work, and the business went broke about a year later. Um, so that just sort of opened my eyes that there's an opportunity to, to look at those challenging, well, those companies that are, a challenge to where the market, where you've got a very different view to what the market has, um, and that and that could be something that's different and and valuable to clients because our clients tend to have I mean people that are successful enough to have money to invest. Uh, they're usually long things like shares, managed funds, property, and if we can deliver them a positive return when in periods of volatility when other parts of their portfolio are going down, that's that's valuable and you know the. The, I suppose the icing on the cake is that if they can hang on to it for long enough, we can actually make them decent money as well. Historically, we have. So it's, it just underpins that element of the few where you don't end up in these situations by magic. You do the hard yards. Uh, you're smart. If your lucky day comes, you double down on it and you create an environment that allows you to be you know, very successful. Well, the key, yeah. there, the key there, Boo, was like, you know, funds management's a really established industry, so you've got to find something that is valuable to your clients or a subset or a niche, so something that they find difficult to do themselves. And um, and that that for us was that downside capture when markets get volatile. Um, so even if, it don't, I think it's the same whether it's a coffee shop or, a you know, any, any business, you, you want to try to be, you need a point of difference for people to even bother spending the time to look at you and um, um, you know so far we've we've done relatively well out of that type of investing um, and yeah it's 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 getting tougher though because there's more people looking at it um, you know when, well, I, way, when you're successful uh, the mimics come out and all of a sudden it gets more and more challenging so wh- how do you deal with a bad day Ben like what, what happens when the market doesn't go your way in a big way yeah and, and sometimes it can be a, a bad month or a bad quarter, and we've had two down years as well, and that, that, that's a challenge. So, I mean, I used to think about it really simplistically about just controlling the controllables, so, you know, healthy, um, you know, healthy habits, uh, win the morning, uh, win the day. Even if you, if you turn up, you've had a swim, you've exercised, you've eaten well, um, the market can tell you up, um, but at least when you go to bed that night, you know, you've done something positive um, and, and you, build, you build from there. I mean, recently, as I've sort of 
cruise past middle age, I've started thinking about it more in terms of mindset and, and looking at setbacks as, as looking for the opportunity in the setback rather than sitting there and thinking, well, you know, woe is me. There's usually a lesson or an opportunity in there. Well, it's the same, that same thing that we often see, Boo, that, that, that thematic or that trend of, of the people that we get on the few who do represent, you know, the few that are actually doing something that they enjoy, they've created success, they've got, you know, choice and all that sort of stuff is about having the, the um, uh, you know, having that, that, that view that the, these challenges or, or potential failures are actually an opportunity to learn. There's always, to learn. There's always, a, there's always a, uh, a silver lining, but also that concept of having routines to ensure that your, you know, your mental state, your emotional state is strong so that you're much more resilient when you go into those sorts of things. So what, let, let's, uh, let's um, maybe look forward a little bit, Ben. You know, what's, what's on the horizon for you over the next you know, five years or so? You got any particular goals, things you want to achieve, or like what, maybe a little bit more about yourself more so mm. than the business, you know? Yeah, well, uh, look, I'm pretty privileged to have, you know, a happy marriage and three healthy kids. Um, and I think as of, you know, being able to recognise that, Work-life balance um, um, is is just as important to give you that sort of resilience to make good decisions when things get difficult. Um, has made me realise that you know I suppose most people are forced to tackle life as you know pursuing wealth, um, health, and happiness. And as I've got older, you know someone pointed out the better way to do it is pursue happiness, health, and wealth. And the, um, the, the second two are often an outcome of the first two. So, yeah, look, I'm, I'm very lucky to have, um, you know, the business in good shape. We've got some, I'm working with, you know, some super smart, young, hungry um, people in our business. Uh, you know, I want to support them in their growth as investors. We've already had a, a spin out of a, a little long only fund that we had here at TOTUS um, last quarter. It's, so we've had our first POTUS Cub, I suppose, from Sam Granger, my old co-PM, um, and I'm thrilled, you know, with his success early on in that in that fund. You know, I remain an investor with Sam, and um, you know, being able to take someone through from a graduate position to starting their own business, you know, is a, is a a nice thing to do, and um, and and it's given me, you know, a lot of pleasure, and you know, and I hope to to follow and enjoy Sam's success for many years. And I think there's an opportunity, um, you know, for the other people in our business to come through and, and do, you know, similar things over time. So look, uh, I've got a young family. I, I love investing. I love, you know, the structure and the discipline of it and the, the challenges. Um, so, you know, with a three-year-old at home, there's no, uh, no thought of retiring or sitting around uh, watching TV for, for many years to come. So, yeah, I think you've got to find the joy in the journey and uh, enjoy, you know, getting a little bit better each day. And that's... You can't, can't contextualise things as age and old. I think you have to contextualise it in terms of wisdom. You're gaining wisdom as you go, but you're, there's, there's no point in letting go of, of, of your youth or letting go of your, your vigour. Um, I think we're unique, our generation, and it will be more unique as other generations come through where we sort of, we sort of get an extra 20 years over our parents in terms of just, just because we've got healthier food, we've got a healthier lifestyle, we understand well-being more. Yeah, we, so we've got all these extra years. And I was just reflecting the other day, you know, sometimes uh, my mojo drops down and it's like I, I did so much purposeful stuff at the age of 40. It's like, geez, what do you, what do, you do now? And you're like, I've got another 10, 20 years to, to churn out with energy here. Uh, and I think that's really exciting and it, it, it kind of reinvigorates you that you have got time and you have got energy to um, to reinvest. Now, Ben, one of the things we talk about are the SLJs, the shitty little jobs, and we spoke about the art. Let's have a little bit of a, bit of a look at the science here because magic, whilst it happens if you're ready for it, it, it only happens if you've done the legwork, right? So how important is the detail, the research and the grind of, of your business? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's almost just the ticket to the dance. You know, there there are, uh, without it, you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. And um, I suppose over time, there's, there's there's sort of three parts to a funds management business. There's research, there's, um, 
there's operations and there's distribution and um, you can't really um, you know succeed without all, all three of those working together um, and I have find, found at times that a lack of focus in one of those areas you know does tend to come back and bite you so you have to um, try you know regardless of um, how much you, you don't enjoy it you do have to force yourself to focus on on some of the stuff that you're not you're not good at as a business owner um, look I, I just think of it as uh, yeah self-discipline and structure trying to um, create those routines whether it's book in the meetings that you don't want to do I, I love the quote from um, Mike Tyson who said you got to uh, you got to do the things you hate sometimes and you've got to do it like you love it you know so uh, they're, they're, the, they're the tough 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 jobs so yeah just, just take them on head on and there has been periods where I've avoided you know those things that I don't find as interesting um, and, and it's always come back to, to bite me so you're better off you know eating your greens first I think it's that it's that thing of of consistency if you do not apply a consistent focus or you know for a, a car reference if you take your foot off the accelerator the car's going to start to slow down you know you could be distracted for a while and then you turn back and the car's gone from 80 to 40 and you've got to put the effort in to get it back up to 80 again so that it's much easier to hold it there than it is to come back from that you know i've definitely found that last year with some other things that went on that pulled me a little bit out of my business i'm now seeing some of the consequences of not having that focus for at part of this year but now since that focus has come back again, I'm now seeing it you know, go back the other way. There's actually something you said before that I, that I wanted to, to touch on, which I thought was quite surprising and we're well, not surprising so, so much for, for the few, but um, something that we've seen quite often, you, you said one of your team that you, you know, brought up through the ranks as a grad and all sort of stuff has now effectively started a business in competition with you, but it sounds like you're incredibly supportive of that. What is it about that? Uh, you know, where does that come from, that ability to support someone who, who can effectively like help the competition to to set up and go yeah well um i don't think it you know our industry it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game so someone doesn't have to lose for you to win um and look there was it, it's natural in particularly these days for um you know people smart young people in particular to, to want to um back themselves and you know i, I was in that position at, at a similar age to sam and there's two ways to look at it. You, you create, you know, problems or you look for solutions. And um, the solution of a spin out was the was first and foremost the least disruptive for our client base in the in the high conviction long only strategy. But but it was a, a great way that you know I could stay in touch and leverage you know the training and that relationship with Sam over the long term uh, and. Uh, you know he's he's repaying that you know in spades through his hard work and and, and our investment in 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 his business um so yeah there's there's sort of you can go around life picking fights with people um or you can um you know look at ways to work together and that that was a that was a good one that so far so good um you know often in our industry um uh, yeah partnerships don't um, end as nicely, so that's something I've tried to. Uh, you know, have, you that experience. have you had have you had experiences where you felt you've been let down by other people, uh, where you've invested time and trust and it hasn't been reciprocated, or have you had a fairly <laughs> gentle journey with that sort of thing? No, we've we've all made. I've made mistakes, um, you know, hiring mistakes, and um, uh, yeah, but but I I think you've got to take ownership of who's you know whose fault is that is that the person you've hired or is that your due diligence uh, and uh yeah I'm, I'm probably not as quick to you know to move on as, as as some in the industry and maybe that's been to my detriment but um yeah no but there's there's been a ton of mistakes along the, along the way and i'm actually you know, really thrilled with it's it's not a wildly successful fund management funds management business by any means, but uh, I'm really happy with what, how we've got here because there's been a lot of, um, you know, school of hard knocks and learning the hard way over the last ten years. What are some of the key lessons you've taken away over the last ten years? What are the key things that really, you know, allowed you to level up? Those things you had to overcome, those challenges, 
that really made you stronger on the other side? What, what's a couple of examples of those? And, and did you have a day where you nearly threw in the towel? Oof. Um, I haven't got to the day where I've nearly thrown in the towel, but I, I have often, you know, I've occasionally looked at bus drivers and gone, wow, and that, that, that might not be the worst job. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's just persistence. You just got to keep plugging along. And as the, the, the great thing about, you know, getting to 10 years is that you realize, um, every time that we've had instances where I thought, you know, that month was a disaster. How do we recover? How do we, how do I, how does this year turn out to look all right? How does, um, um, you know, how could we have, how could we have done that or how could we have done better? And, and things turn, you know, extremely quickly. Um, and, you know, usually you learn something out of those experiences. So I, I think the, the key thing is persistence and, um, and turning up um, and, and realizing that not just in the bad times that thing will, things will get better, but also that humility in the, in the good times. Um, you know, that there is an elastic band in markets and that occasionally the market, you know, everything in, that you're doing is, is um, agrees with, the market agrees with, and that can turn very quickly. So you, you might do nothing wrong in your analysis um, and, and something comes out of left field like a, um, a pandemic or a, a change of Fed chairman or government and, um, and you can have a tough six months. So, so being able to recognize that that's part of the deal, that it's part of the journey, and that makes the good times um, you know, much more valuable when, when you finally get there. I've got this philosophy where I reckon I, I, I use the metaphor of uh, free climbing. You know, when people rock climb, they're not tied to the rock face, that they access this reserve that you don't normally tap into. And I think what you're talking about there, when you feel like you're depleted, something's happened beyond your control, you put all this effort in and it didn't pan out. There's something about being on the edge of that cliff without a rope that seems to empower your neural pathways and synapses start firing and you you see things that you've never seen before. Have you experienced a, that type of scenario? Yeah, well, Boo, I think, you know, we talked about it um, a while back um, off, offline, but yeah, early days in my, in my business, um, yeah, I, I was, I was, I had a, a marriage breakup and was, you know, living on a mate's couch for a, for a period there. You're, you're in good company with that, by the way, mate. So, pardon? You're in good company yeah. with that scenario. <laughs> Look at yeah, it's the the, the odds are it's going to happen. Um, but it did happen at a at a tricky time in you know my career. The business was loss making. Um, you know, we had no real you know runs on the board. The business was very young. Um, you know, it's stressful when you leave a high paying job to, to go into a business to choose cash. Um, you know, family. It's difficult for families to adjust. Um, but but it turned out to be you know one of the 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 better periods of performance for our for our business. And really, you know, when the your back is to the wall and there's the pressure is on, um, you know, we've tended to perform you know quite quite well. Um, you know, we saw it. You know, earlier this year, you know, we had that period where markets sort of um, the, you know, the punters or the retail investors really started to make the professional investors look silly over the second half of um, 2020. And, you know, we had clients that question, you know, our process and, and, and you know, our strategy over the medium term. And, and we've just had three or four of the better months we've had in five or six years. So, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn. Um, I'm actually over time getting more nervous when things go too well, just looking around the corner for, you know, what's the next, there's got to be a speed bump here somewhere. Um, uh, but recognizing that, yeah, that, that I've got to try and treat those as learning experiences and opportunities um, and that, you know, life goes on. And speaking of returns, mate, you, you've been double digit returning now for, you know, quite some time, really solid last uh, four or five years. I mean, you're outperforming market. It must give you a nice sense of achievement and purpose. There's, there's, there's something, I mean, in finance sectors, there's a lot of individuals go into it, enrich themselves, but I get a sense for you, it's about enriching others. It's, it's about the collective win. Uh, and it must feel good when you're 
able to speak to investors and, and have created wealth for them in, in a relatively passive way for them? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I think it's better to make money, um, you know, for everybody. It's, it's, it's um, and we'll, a lot of my clients are retirees that can't make the money back. So there's a big responsibility uh, around, you know, preserving that capital um, over time. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I was relatively confident with my investing skills prior to setting up the business. I'd, I'd managed to put a, enough money away to give it a go and my, my track record of, of um, looking after assets prior to launching the business was, was solid. But throw in a, starting a small business, um, you know, complexities like, um, you know, human resources, compliance, um, you know, the, the bar keeps getting raised in terms of... Um, all, all than just your skill. And I think people that start their own business don't realise that. You might be really proficient at something and work in a corporate environment really well, but you, it's like a 3X factor of extra work you have to do to run a business, pay the phone bills. Just real, really basic admin stuff, isn't it? And it's that people yeah. don't know what they don't know. You know, when you start out, you don't know that there's all this extra stuff. And then you're like, when you find it out, it's like, whoa, where did that come from? Very, yeah. And you look at your bank balance at the end of the month and it's like, holy shit, where's, where did that 10 grand go? That was not what I was expecting to see at the end of the month. So true, boo. I mean, when you think about, yeah, is there a time when I thought, geez, I should throw it in? It was the first year we had our um, financial services license audit from ASIC, which you have to do as a, as a license holder. And there was no one else to, you know, prepare the audit stuff. It was me on a Friday night, you know, over in sort of shared office space in, in Mossman, uh, you know, cruising home at 10 o'clock in the rain <laughs> on a Vespa. I was like, this is, um, you know, this is character building. And it turns out it, it was. Um, you downsized to a Vespa, mate. You, you literally oh, went all in. Yeah, no, I didn't get to keep the car. <laughs> so it was really, uh, yeah, back to the wall. And, uh, you know, honestly, that's, uh, it was in hindsight, one of the best things that could happen, you know, in terms of. After that, though, there's there's vibrancy in life when you're living. That's raw living, you know. And I think a lot of people that become successful and like I always found the transition from founding and growing a business into running it really hard because it just felt uh, maybe it's just that adrenaline junkie type of mindset, but it's it's hard to do. Uh, so it's it's fascinating. Again, going from being very comfortable, obviously, and well paid in what you were doing. Uh, working in the institutional world uh, down into creating something from from nothing, which is a really cool and recurring story in the future. It takes a lot of courage to do as well. So, and uh, obviously in your journey, you would have would have you've clearly learnt quite a lot of stuff. Um, if you were to go back to a younger version of yourself and pass one key piece or a couple of key pieces of learning to yourself, um, what would they actually be? Yeah, look, um, I, I think you just got to have the. Uh, I, I would encourage young people to just think long term. Um, you know, Bezos talks about you, you underestimate. Um, you know, you overestimate what you can achieve in two or three years, but you underestimate what you can achieve in you know seven, seven to ten years. So that um, longer term thinking and putting and you know, keeping things in in perspective. Um, you know, obviously, I just think integrity is key to you know, everything in business and, and life. And, um, you know, the people that I've worked with who, uh, you know, who haven't had integrity, it hasn't worked out for them or they're, you know, in the long run. So whilst they might have won some battles in the short term, um, you know, the, the, the scoreboard in the long term goes against you if you don't have integrity. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, um, and could, you know, that, that daily self-discipline, just just try to be a slightly better version of yourself each day, whether it's, you know, the, the run around the block on Strava once a week or, um, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, uh, just try to do it a little better. And and don't be afraid to be out of your comfort zone. I mean, that's what I'm learning and, and trying to put myself through in this mid middle life period is uh, get a bit more comfortable being uncomfortable. And I reckon that's I reckon that happens as you get older. I, I find myself now struggling more with what you know the whole point of everything is than you ever had before because you're so 
focused and charging and and then you get to a point which is like you've worked from the bottom of the the shelf behind the bar to the top you've got great connections great for everything's like good and it, i know there's like a there shouldn't be discomfort there but there is it's a, it's a really weird feeling yeah I've, I've done that once or twice and looked around people in my you know office when i worked at ubs looked at the managing directors and that is that what I really want to do? Is that where I want to be in 10 years? And I, I've, I've been lucky enough to look around, you know, successful fund managers and, and had good relationships with a few. And um, you've really got to pick the, the model that works for you best in the long term and, and, um, and, and occasionally check yourself and say, is this journey that I'm on the right one or am I just on the mouse wheel um, at, where, where there's no end? So well, I, think, I think, Ben, often it's, um, often it's actually not our our path we sometimes especially uh, when we're younger get uh, all these uh, take on board other people's opinions or perspectives and, and go down a path that they suggest and i think one of the things we see with the few is that it's actually about getting off that track and going okay what is the track i actually want to be on did i really want to be on that well i thought i wanted to be on it because everyone said it was going to be good and i was great at that and you know i had a capability i was actually you know did it well but do i actually love it do i actually love what i'm doing or is it gradually you know eating me alive because i'm not actually doing something like you've done is having the courage to go from high level uh, corporate roles literally straight out of the you know uh, straight out into the bloody wilderness on your own with a with a hatchet and a bottle of water you know and you've got to kind of start from scratch and um you know that's that's such the such a you know powerful representation of the determination and grit it takes for people to go from that point and 10 years later you know, be running a successful business, have built a, a successful life, you know, marriage, family, all that sort of stuff that goes with it, that that really does truly represent, you know, the few and why we have, uh, have uh, you know, why we've, we've invited, you know, I'll ask you to come onto the podcast today. So, yeah. Thank you. I've, I've got one. Uh, there's a great quote from Bezos. The, um, again, I keep coming back to Bezos. We've got Amazon's a, a big position in our fund, it reported this morning. <laughs> um, but, but Bezos has that, um, you know, the, the decision process is the, re- you know, will, when, when I'm 80, will I look back on this decision and which, which one will I regret? Will I regret doing it or will I regret not doing it? Um, and I think that's just a, a great model for, um, you know, making decisions, um, you know, that are, that are major in your life. Uh, that's awesome, mate. Great, great segue. Look, we better go. I think Sean's got to get back to his nude survivor with his uh, bottle of water and hatchet. Uh, get get it raw, mate, don't you think? <laughs> well, it's still warm and sunny up here. I can go outside, so yeah, why not? <laughs> awesome. Ben, thanks uh, so much for being generous with your time today, mate, and, and sharing your uh, story uh, with a few. Uh, I know that if anyone's out there and you're wondering what to do with those uh, shekels in the bottom of your pocket, that loose change, uh, ben, I'd love if you uh, reached out and uh, touched base with uh, Titus Capital, who um, is his, his baby and he's done an awesome job. Uh, amazing job, mate. It's really great to have the opportunity to speak to you today. And that wraps up another episode of The Few. Thank you to our partners, Afterburner, for team building, development and alignment. We understand now how important it is to have the right people around you. Get them on board with where you want to go. Momentum Media the largest industry publisher in the country, connecting your business to the Australian community. ICMI, Australia's premier speaker bureau, representing the few that do fulfill their life's purpose. And finally, Sean's Inner Circle, the business coaching organization for small and medium enterprises looking to make that next step. Thanks again for listening in and downloading today. Please leave a review on whatever platform you are currently listening to this podcast and reach out to our partners who can help you make the transition to the few. Thanks for coming on, Ben. Thank you both, Boo and Sean. Have a good one.